Welcome to Think Tech on OC16, Hawaii's weekly newscast on things that matter to tech and to Hawaii. I'm Duke Oishi. And I'm Zuri Bender. In our show this time, we're giving you an update on the modern perceptions and critical possibilities of the Alawai Canal, presented by our very own Sachiko Slomoff. The Alawai Canal borders Waikiki and is the beautiful but looming and oft-forgotten anachronism among Hawaii's public spaces. Walter F. Dillingham organized construction of the Alawai in the 1920s, almost 100 years ago, to clean up the swamp and vegetation bordering Waikiki. After all these years, the Alawai is seriously polluted. In 2006, a man died from a flesh-eating bacterial infection after falling in waters from the Alawai.
According to Hawaii's Department of Public Works Storm Drainage Standards, the Aloai Canal is classified as Class A waters, meaning that the use and objective of this storm drainage system is to be recreational and to be kept clean of any trash or garbage that hinders recreation or enjoyment. But when is the last time you saw someone swimming in the canal? Have you ever wanted to take a nice dip in the Aloai? Has the original vision for the Aloai been forgotten? Has it been thrown to waste? The Alawai Canal has such potential, therefore it also needs protecting. The canal has often had critical levels of enterococci bacteria found in it, much above safe levels. If the Alawai overflowed, it would have health implications far beyond flooding the streets of Waikiki. Think Tech Hawaii's local correspondent Sachiko Slomoff interviewed some of the public to gauge perceptions and concerns over the Alawai. She talked to millennials, teenagers, security guards working in Waikiki, and concerned citizens who offered their ideas and alternatives to improve the Alawai. It's a beautiful resource, you know, it's, and uh, I, I, I walk by, I get at my exercise. No one likes to see water polluted, so, you know, the water resources is an important resource to the state of Hawaii and, and it uh, should be taken care of properly. It made me sad that I couldn't go swimming in the water because I, I had to be concerned about um, getting staph infection or whatever kind of infections, you know. I don't like dirty water. No one likes dirty water. It has a lot of potential, I think, yeah. uh, but currently it's kind of dirty and uh, has a bad reputation to be extremely dirty, like people don't even want to get in the water and where it drains out at Alamoana Harbor is kind of, I know after it rains, it's kind of dangerous to surf there just because all the bacteria in the water. And so there's a lot of s beautiful cities that have like a river walk or something like that, they call it. And I, I feel like the Alawai could be something like that where it's almost like a nice little park by the water, kind of with lots of nice, trees and plants and areas to hang out and eat, picnic, uh, next to a nice water, waterway or whatever. But I know there's been sewage leaks in the Alawai and things like that. When it, when it floods a lot, it kind of gets really dirty and toxic. If they really clean it up where kids can play and swim and it's not dangerous, you know, it's just, I don't know, but it would be a big job. Lots of different ways to clean it up. So, in my job as an electrical distributor, we kind of specialize in water treatment, so sewage and drinking water and all that. So, but for areas of stagnant water, similar to the Alawai, but that need to be treated, but it has to be safe to go into the ocean. Um, one way that's done is through just aeration or oxygenation. Mm -hmm. So basically there's lots of tubes that are placed at the base or at the bottom and all it does is put oxygen or air bubbles bubbling through the water and that allows the good bacteria to grow and then they feed off of all the bad bacteria and clean up all the toxins and it's just a natural process kind of like the wetlands in florida and how swamp areas and things like that maybe like more community events um that they could market and i don't know having like an art show on the alawai that people could come to or like a concert would be cool or even like canoe paddling um, like watching some cultural Hawaiian well my friend uh, just went paddling the other day and he had an open wound and oh. after some of the splashing got in his arm it did start uh, there's like a very vulgar description of you know like pus and all the stuff that arose from it and he claims oh. it's because of the, the bacteria and stuff in the Alawai. Oh my god. I've heard too many too many stories like the one that, that I just explained and um yeah yeah no just I would wait until we clean it up. yeah I think it'd be a good investment um with like regards to urban planning everything should be sustainable uh mm -hmm. and the environment matters and I mean if we clean our beaches we should clean our canal I think overall even though it does have some sort of negative stigma attached to it it still is a really beautiful attraction of Honolulu and um I think it's valued like it should be well valued and highly thought of in Hawaii and by its people, so it can have a positive impact on the overall community. I'm here on vacation, just one week. I have a friend who lives, um, you know, just a few blocks from the canal here, and, um, you know, just walking down this 
um, brought um, this walkway here. I think it's beautiful. Um, but you know, it's just there's a few things I notice. You know, there's just there is a lot of trash in the water. Um, you get thousands of tourists daily throughout these um, you know local areas, and it represents a um, kind of respect for it almost. And you can reach a point where there's no return on the local you know sample lands. Um, so. Yeah, I don't know. It should be a primary concern. I have worked on like cases where there are individuals that have um, actually fell into the Alawai and actually um, died because of open wounds. Um, some of the some of the problems with the Alawai that it is it is quite filthy. It does have opportunist, opportunistic um, bacteria like Vibrio vonificus and other staph um, staphylococcus type of grouped. Let me go into a little bit details about how bad it was with the whole flesh-eating um, case. This person actually fell in and this person had was in the emergency room for like about two days and he lost a few limbs and because of so many blood loss and limbs that he lost and he went to I believe a septic shock he like passed away. Yes, I think the state should do something about this Alawai Canal. I think that people who are like paddling in it, they're doing things in it. There's like a lot of precautions they have to take when, you know, they they're, they they have wounds. I think that's one of the biggest things for me is that if I'm in a dirty environment, I'm a little paranoid. I wouldn't want to like be in the open waters with wounds just because I know that I'll be like injured. I'll, I'll end up with some kind of like bacterial infection that I'd be worried about. I know what it takes. There's going to be a lot of environmentalists that needs to do some work in here. Like, I think there's a lot of lack of maintenance from the state. On this island of limited space and natural resources, the Alawai represents one crucial resource that Hawaii has yet to fully protect and enjoy. It is perhaps a resource that we have let gone to waste. What is the future of the Alawai, and what can we do about it? But how serious is this for our community? How worried should we be? You can judge for yourself on what we should do to have the Alawai reach its full potential as an aesthetic and healthy element of our city. I went to the Alawai last weekend, and as before, I was dismayed. Yes, the sun and the reflections of the condos sparkled off the water, and that was good. But if you looked closer, you'd see tons of schmutz and debris in brown water. Clearly nothing to write home about. On the Mackay side, yes, there are canoe houses and ramps, some broken, but not much going on. In fact, the paddling season this year was ruined by a raw sewage spill into the canal. There are no restaurants, no food, no bathrooms, no rose gardens here. Wasn't there a canal side restaurant at McCulley years ago? What happened to it? Ah, uh, maybe it was the smell. Nobody knows what creatures live or die in the toxic muck of the canal. Let your imagination be your guide. But make no mistake, the finger in the eye here is the golf course, which occupies hundreds of acres along and around the Alawai, right in the middle of our city, sucking up all that land for the benefit of a handful of city government insiders who are entitled to play. Why can't the canal and the area around the canal be made into a public park? Why can't the public have access to enjoy this land? We so desperately need parks in our city. It's extraordinary that in 2015, the public is deprived of the use of this priceless urban land, and no one makes the slightest sound about it. This is just another example of how we are slowly, tragically losing our public spaces and thus our quality of life in Hawaii. It's a collective abandonment, and it's sad. With all the congestion and compression of our overcrowded city, public spaces are increasingly important. But we ignore that need for public spaces, and we keep squeezing our people into tiny, unaffordable apartments with no access to open spaces. Where are all the protesters when we need them? What a waste for the city to spend money on this huge, but inaccessible golf course when it doesn't have money to fix the roads or the natatorium. The priorities are backward. One or two people are fishing along the dusty banks as I watch. Would you eat that fish? Oh my God. Less likely would you swim there. 
I wonder what the paddlers think. Surely they worry about getting splashed or worse, falling in. There's a bike path and some green space on the Malka side, but no one's there. It's clear that the space is not well designed. Have we no designers, no engineers in Hawaii? The Malka side of the canal is the better side, but is tragically limited by the golf course and is not designed, built, or maintained as a park should be. I notice there's a porta potty and some residual construction materials there, but there's no construction going on, making it a kind of junkyard. This is failed public space, and the city should be embarrassed. The area on the Alawai Boulevard side, the Mackay side, is worse. The walkway is way too narrow, and the grass is neither walkable nor maintained. You can easily fall in, and many people have. Both a taxi and a van have fallen in this year, with more falling surely to follow. One solution is to remove the parking. Alawai Boulevard should be narrowed, and the walking path should be widened at least as much. If that requires condemnation, so be it. Regrettably, some mayors ago, we gave the walkway away to parking for the condos and walk-ups across the street. And so we removed that land from public use and recreation. That should be reversed, even if it means a fight with the people who now park there. So the Mackay side is also a failed public space. It's neither attractive nor appealing, and it's neither being used nor maintained. Where there is grass, it is often 18 inches high and hasn't been mowed in months or years. That's inexcusable. But maintenance, however badly needed, will not fix the alawai. The canal and surrounding land needs to be redesigned and rebuilt on all four sides. But there's no discussion or prospect of anything like that happening anytime soon. You can say it has great potential, but that's theoretical only. The reality is that it's fallen into disrepair and disuse. It could be so much more appealing and useful to locals and tourists. I hate to think how long since it's been dredged or cleaned. No surprise that people don't come around. It could be, should be, a paradise for walking, jogging, or cycling, but it's much too narrow and down and fragmented for that. What a shame. What a loss. What a waste. But this is the border of Waikiki, the engine of our state's economy, and should be one of the finest public spaces in the city. However, it's tragically one of the worst. It could be an oasis, a jewel, but it's a failure and in some places an eyesore. In an article two years ago, Civil Beat raised that question as to whether Walter F. Dillingham's efforts to build the canal 100 years ago was in fact Hawaii's biggest engineering mistake. So maybe the canal needs a complete re-engineering too. So who's responsible for this mess? If the Alawai is supposed to be an extension of Waikiki that will give tourists a view of our environmental beauty it's not doing that at all. It's rather a statement that we don't care about our tourists, our environment, or our citizens. A huge embarrassment. So far, the homeless have not moved in, except for a few in the Kapahulu side. But you know they will, and then the Alawai is going to be that much less interesting to the public. If the Alawai is an example of how well we do parks or civil engineering, it's not much of an example. We should be doing a far better job on restoring and taking care of it. This should be a priority for the city, and every cognizant public official should be doing something about it. Is anyone listening? Are you? Take a walk there and see for yourself. See what's going on or not. I'm Jay Fidel with this Think Tech commentary.
And now, let's take a look at our ThinkTech calendar of events going forward. ThinkTech broadcasts its talk shows live on the internet from noon to 5 p.m. on weekday afternoons, and then we broadcast our earlier shows all night long. If you missed a show or want to replay or share any show, they're all archived on demand on YouTube. Visit ThinkTechHawaii.com for our weekly calendar and our live stream and YouTube links, or better yet, to sign up on our email list to get the daily docket of our upcoming shows. ThinkTech has a great new studio at Pioneer Plaza. We invite you to come down, see our studio, and be part of our live audience. Contact Jay at ThinkTechHawaii.com. Be a part of our civic engagement on ThinkTech. Go ahead, give us a thumbs up on YouTube or send us a tweet at ThinkTechHI. We want to know what you're thinking and how you feel about current issues and events affecting Hawaii. We want you to stay in touch with us and we want to stay in touch with you. Let's think together. On Thursday, September 17th, ThinkTech will join with the Anthology Marketing Group to present a program called Whither Thou Goest Waikiki, Engine of Our State's Economy, at the Anthology Theatre in Bishop Square. The program will cover the status and prospects of the hospitality industry in Hawaii and will feature business, government, and academic experts on tourism in Hawaii. Join us and raise your awareness about the critical changes taking place in Hawaii. Be a part of the conversation and sign up to attend on thinktechhawaii.com. And now, here's this week's ThinkTech Commentary. I'm Donna Blanchard and this is a ThinkTech Commentary. I'd like to talk about Islamic State militants. In particular, let's talk about Sunni Muslim jihadists following the caliphate known as ISIS or ISIL. A caliphate is a form of Islamic government led by a caliph, a person considered a political and religious successor to the prophet Muhammad and a leader of the Muslim community. ISIS declared itself a caliphate in June of 2014. ISIS means the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. Their aim is to build a new country consisting of Syria and Iraq and a few other Middle Eastern countries for Sunni Muslims. ISIL is the emerging term which recognizes that the group is now extending their influence beyond Iraq and Syria. The L stands for Levant, which is an approximate historical geographic term referring to a large area in the eastern Mediterranean. ISIL is linked to Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan and Pakistan, and the Taliban, which also began in Afghanistan and Pakistan, and are dominant in Iraq and Iran. The Al-Shabaab in Somalia is tied to ISIL. The Boko Haram in Nigeria has taken a vow of fealty for ISIL. These groups have followers in the Philippines, Indonesia, China, Myanmar, Bangladesh, India, Turkey, Syria, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Egypt, France, the United Kingdom, the United States, and Canada, among others. They want to enforce their view of conservative Islamic traditions and values. Anyone not following these traditions and values is an infidel, and they don't want us around. How is it that they've grown so vastly and relatively quickly? Well, they are practicing some pretty brilliant tactics, appealing to the reptilian brain of the most likely candidates to join them and increase their strength. The reptilian brain is the rudimentary fight-or-flight governance center of the brain. When all is going well and our lives are comfortable, we don't access that center much. If you don't have regular access to basic life-sustaining necessities, if you live without physical safety or are an emotionally disconnected teen in Iraq or Iowa, you're probably spending some time in that reptilian brain. ISIL fighters are also recruiters. They're using social media like professionals, locating and luring disenfranchised, lost, and angry people. They offer solace, purpose, community, and care. They brag about their bloody battles on Twitter, and those who engage with appreciation, a favorite or retweet, are exactly the people ISIL recruiters want, and they engage with mind-blowing passion and immediacy. 
In Anna Errol's book, In the Skin of a Jihadist, a young journalist enters the ISIS recruitment network, she describes a seduction of such strength, tenderness, and care, it could be found in the romance section of the library. That reptilian brain exists in all of us, and ISIL recruiters know that. All they have to do is wait for it to show up, whether because of civil unrest, need for basic physical safety and security, or emotional neglect. So let's work to keep it up. We'll be right back to wrap up this week's edition of Think Tech. But first, we want to thank our underwriters who are so important to us. <music> Okay, Zuri, that wraps up this week's edition of Think Tech. Remember, you can watch Think Tech on OC16 several times every week. Can't get enough of it, just like Sachko Slomov does. For additional times, check out OC16.tv. For lots more Think Tech videos and for underwriting opportunities on Think Tech on OC16, visit thinktechhawaii.com. Be a guest, a volunteer, a producer, or intern, and help us to reach and have an impact on Hawaii. Thanks so much for being part of our Think Tech Ohana and for supporting our open discussion of tech, energy diversification, and globalism in Hawaii. You can watch this show throughout the week and tune in next Sunday evening for our next important weekly episode. I'm Duke Oishi. Aloha, everyone. And I'm Zuri Bender. Aloha, everyone. Aloha.